I'm Roland Brookman from UC Berkeley. So I never meant to be a geodesist. So it actually took two earthquakes to get me interested in geodesy. The first one was the 1987 Superstition Hills earthquake. And Roger Billum uh, at the University of Colorado Boulder um, essentially needed help to work on um, creep meters that he installed on the fault. So I went with him. Um, and that was sort of my first exposure with some uh, geodetic techniques, um, even though otherwise my research back then was as a structural geologist. And then as a PhD student at Stanford working uh, with Dave Pollard, again in structural geology, took the Loma Prieta earthquake, which happened very soon after I arrived in the Bay Area, that made me want to go out and, and participate in, in responses. And I went with Paul Siegel, uh, who was uh, doing GPS measurements to study the earthquake and post-earthquake deformation. And the post-earthquake deformation later became part of my own research. And that got me more and more involved in, in geodesy. So I don't call myself a geodesist. Geodesy is my favorite tool uh, of, of observation, but it's just one of the tools that as a really geologist uh, who uses geological and geophysical tools to better understand the Earth uh, can use to, to improve our understanding of the earthquake cycle and earth rheology, active tectonics. So um, geodesy is great, but I'm not a geodesist. So I first started using geodetic techniques um, as part of a research project focused on post-earthquake deformation from the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. So we used GPS in the early days where we had to go out at night to take our measurements and establish a time series of these transient uh, displacements. So that was really one of the very first studies where we had solid information um, due to the, the development of GPS for this purpose. So there's a fair number of um, research problems that we do address with geodetic tools. One is uh, still focused on earthquake cycle deformation, uh, deformation before earthquakes, right during earthquakes, soon after and in years and decades uh, after a large earthquake, which tell us, tells us something about the mechanics of faults of the earth, the rheology of the crust and upper mantle. But we also use geodesy, GPS, and INSA to study active landslides, volcanoes, uh, really any earth systems that um, uh, geodesy helps us um, get a deeper understanding of. Well, clearly the, the first one that's very evident is that without UNAFCO in the early days, we wouldn't have been able to uh, do the kind of studies of plate boundary deformation that were done in the late 80s, early 90s that really started this whole field of crustal deformation research in California and Central Asia. And so that's where UNAFCO was clearly instrumental, instrumental and that used to be its main and, and uh, maybe even sole focus. Um, other important breakthroughs thanks to UNAFCO, um, development or aiding the community in developing uh, the Plate Boundary Observatory uh, as part of EarthScope clearly uh, is a major thing. And I don't think we as a community could have done it without UNAFCO, without that kind of community organization. Uh, so that's, that's another really big one. So, so UNAFCO has, has certainly, UNAFCO the facility as well as UNAFCO the community really were instrumental in developing GPS to what it is today uh, with regards to software, testing hardware, uh, receivers, um, ways of uh, improving the stability of monuments. Uh, so there's a whole number of you know very detailed things that probably wouldn't have happened without that kind of concerted and, and facility 
based, based effort. Um, and more recently, UNAFCO has broadened out. It has brought in um, INSA Research, the WINSA archive, which it now hosts, um, LIDAR technology. I know there's interest in other technology. So UNAFCO always tries to be there for the community when it comes to new technology that any individual researcher has a much more difficult time owning and, and establishing for their research. Well, it's become richer and more exciting um, uh, with time. You know, we started out with these very episodic measurements um, every few months, and we thought that was the only thing we were interested in seeing were things that took years to happen. Now with high-rate geodesy, with radar interferometry, with extremely high spatial resolution, um, essentially the more we measure, the more we see. And so, um, there doesn't seem to be any end in sight with that. Geodesy seems to continue to improve in the measurement and thereby improve the science we can do with it. So I don't think anybody anticipated that when UNAFCA started 30 years ago. What does the future hold for geodesy? Um, Ever-improving measurements, probably more breakthroughs as those measurements um, are being developed. Um, I'm sure we will conquer the 70% of the planet that we haven't really measured yet. Seafloor geodesy is, to date, very, very difficult to do, very expensive. Only very few groups and countries have even been able to dabble in it. And so there's going to be a major work left to do in developing techniques that are uh, both precise and affordable to, to do that. And there may be other things that we don't even uh, imagine yet. And another thing that will happen more and more is integration of measurements of geodetic sorts and other geophysical measurements, uh, seismic measurements, time dependent, uh, seismic imaging, um, gravity measurements, magnetic measurements, resistivity, they all reflect some aspect of Earth processes and so geodesy is just one part of that and the more we integrate those um, I think the better the science will get. No, I think we, um, we should all be thankful for UNAFCO to have been there which is really has always been a community effort. So UNAFCA is really a reflection of people realizing that as a community we can uh, do better than uh, everybody on their own. And I think it's, it's a nice model of, of uh, that being a good way to do science.